you're receiving some honours on January 26th. This yes, year. quite a surprise. Um, I'm receiving the uh, OAM, which is what it is. It's the Order of Australia Medal, I think it's called, which is amazing. I'm very uh, honoured and uh, humbled to get it, actually. It's quite surprising. And yeah. you're getting it for your service to the... Service to the music industry. Yes, well, I, I guess when they say service, it's probably, I guess, achievements in the music industry because it's been a long time now, so that we've, I've been a musician for a very long time. Yeah. yeah, I mean, when you first started out, did you really think that this is where you'd end up so many years later? Um, well, you, you hope to. I mean, when I started writing songs when I was like 11 and then um, uh, became a professional musician probably... 18 or 19, but 1972 actually was when I came to Melbourne, so I would have been a bit older in the early 20s. But it was always the expectation back in those days that, that um, why couldn't I have an international career? I mean, I didn't feel that I couldn't, and so I just concentrated on my, my songwriting was really all I wanted to do, and then I, had, I formed bands to play my songs and over a period of Adelaide bands to start and then eventually led to Mississippi and then finally to Little River Band. And that's when we, we had a definite a mission and a, and a view to go to America and be the first Australian living band living in Australia that could crack America. Because before we did it in 76 was when we went there, there weren't any other Australian bands that ever thought that they could have a career in America. So. They all went to England and we went to England as well and then came back but then we realised, well, Australia is just as close artistically to America as what in England is. So we decided we'll just live in Australia, record here, work here and then release our records in America. Do you think of yourself as a trailblazer? Well, we, we were ab absolutely were at the time because, I mean, if you're the first, because nobody ever thought that it could happen and and it really is the toughest market in the world. I mean, even the some of the great artists that have ever been, they haven't ever, a lot of them haven't actually broken in America. And it's really, a, it's another planet over there as a, as a performer compared to anywhere else. I mean, it's the holy grail. We're just lucky to, well, lucky but incredible amounts of work and sacrifice because we were away from our families for just months on end and uh, living with together with you know sharing hotel rooms and doing everything and it's um but that's just what we did you know we on our first tour we just told our wives and girlfriends we don't know when we'll be back we just got on the plane and went and five and a half months later we come back is there a moment looking back over so many years where you think that was the moment i knew that we had really cracked it that we had we were onto something big well i think we, we had such great belief in ourselves in the band. When we first went to America, we, we cracked America by being support acts to some of the big names of the time. You know, we, we supported like Boz Gags and Jimmy Buffett and eventually we played with the Eagles. But we played with Fleetwood Mac and we were doing like 13 shows a fortnight. So every night we would fly or drive to another support. And then on, that, on the second tour, when Help Us On Its Way got released, then we started to get more applause than the act that we were supporting and that became a bit of a problem. So we had to, then we started to headline. But I think when Reminiscing hit number three in America, that was the, we knew then that, that, that we had really made it big time then. Some music from that sort of era is having a bit of a resurgence, Fleetwood Mac's back in the charts. Yep. Do you think that Little River Band is still relevant and popular in 2021? Well, uh, I can say that our, uh, like our Spotify uh, downloads are increasing about 20% a year. They're increasing. So um, there's no question that, that when we look at the reports from the record company that the, uh, the, the plays and the interest in the band worldwide is just increasing. Because, see, the bands from that era are not getting replaced. They never will be replaced because what we were lucky enough to have in the in the 70s will never be again because of coronavirus, because of all of the restrictions now. You could never just six guys get on a plane and go and tour America. They just couldn't do it. 
anymore. And, and there's not the financial support from the record companies because they don't support like they used to. We had such a fantastic amount of money put behind us from Capital Records because they could see we were starting to break. And so as soon as they can see that, then they would just put unlimited resources to make sure that you get to that next level. Because back in those days, about 96% of acts that were signed to labels would not make money for the label. It was that top four or five percent, and they make a lot of money out of the out of the bands that that make it big. So we were fortunate that those. And the other thing was that when we first signed with Capitol Records, it was an eight album deal. So they it wasn't like we'll put out one single and see if it works, and then we'll give you. They committed to us for eight albums. And they actually said it might take us four albums to actually break you in America. They were willing to commit to that sort of, it's a career commitment. And we broke it on our second release there. So that was, we were given that opportunity that just unfortunately isn't there now anymore. What advice would you give to a, a young musician who wants to make it? Well, I think the first thing is don't want to make it. Uh, because the the first any musician has to do it because they love to do it. So my because I, I have two sons who are musicians and they uh, they, they they're working on finding the best career that they can. But uh, with given the circumstances today, but when I was young, all I was concerned about was the music, and I never thought, well, what if this career doesn't work out, or what if I don't make it, so to speak, um. It, uh, but it was a different era because we were able to do gigs like you would, you could get do seven gigs a week. You know, you, you, there was plenty of work for live musicians, which is not the case today. You see, so all I can say is I think it's the same thing, and um, and I was thinking of like what's an example of today, and I'm I'm not that much up today, but I, I think of like Tones and I who became massive, and I believe that. Uh, that came from just basically busking in the street, but it must have come from a love of the music that uh, she wanted to uh, perform. So if you're meant to be there, if you're meant to, for it meant to happen, there, there, a way will happen. And, and the, the mechanism's there. To, you can be discovered on YouTube or whatever. But uh, if you want to be in the music business just to get rich and famous or to be adored, that's not the reason. The reason is you want to express your music because you have to express your music, that's, that keeps you alive. So for me, my songwriting and my music's been my life's companion. You see, it helped me through my teenage years and when I was growing up and that was the most important thing in my life and it's still the most important thing in my life, you see. So it's if you've got that, uh, I was blessed to have a wonderful career and we did very well. But my, the greatest joy I had was sitting down with my guitar and writing a song like Reminiscing. Uh, uh, just, just to pull that out of the air and enjoy the experience of thinking, well gee, I've written something that I think is pretty good. Uh, and if it happens to go worldwide, well, that's wonderful. But it doesn't, that's not, even, that's not better than actually that moment of when you discover it in the first place. So that's the essence of being a songwriter and a musician is enjoy the moment of your creativity because that's the, as good as it ever gets. Coronavirus has absolutely clobbered the live music industry. Mm -hmm. What do you see as the way forward for musicians coming out of this time? The government have got a government have to help uh, because um, it's not just musicians. It's every. It's all the ancillary front road crew. Um, just the technical people behind it. There's, we have got so many world-class people here, whether it be in film or in theatre or in, in, uh, in all forms of the arts. But where are the arts on the list of priorities? Like they don't make the headlines. We don't even have a, an independent, um, like just, uh, we used to have, I, I believe, um, a Minister of the Arts and that's all they did. Well, now it's sort of attached to eight other portfolios and we need the arts now more than we ever have. Like with what 
not, it's not just what the musicians are going through, it's what everyone else is going through. The world is changing big time. There's no security anywhere. We don't know what this year will bring um, and what, where our lives are going. So it's, it's the arts that can comfort and the arts can also tell the story of what the coronavirus is doing to people's lives. It's documenting that. But to, for performers to be able to be out there or for shows to be written or for films to be made, it needs to be helped a lot by government funding. Um, it seems, particularly in Melbourne, um, you, you know, if you kick a, kick a goal at the MCG, you get a, get a bronze statue put up for you or something. But it, if, no matter what you do in the arts, you, you don't get any support or recognition. And Melbourne is such a great art town, and Australia is such a great art community, but we don't revere the, the artists the way that we do the sports people or the business people or the mining people. Or, and so I would say the artists are ready and, we, and, and they've got great things to say and to give, but it's going to need some help and need some big help from... I mean, we can't just simply leave all the theatres and venues empty and leave all these incredibly talented young people with nothing to do. It's just not right. Because if they're born to be songwriters or musicians or artists, that's what they should be doing. They shouldn't have to go and work jobs that, are, that they're not skilled at. They should be supported and because we all need to go and see a film or to listen to music or to have something. I mean, you can't even have a wedding without a music. So we, we, we need that all supported. But the people that provide that music, say for weddings, they have to try and earn a living. And they can't do it with the way it is at the moment. What inspires you to write songs? Where do you draw inspiration from? Well, more in, more in the past, just, just my own life. I, I, I think that if you look deep enough, all songwriting is, bio, is autobiographical. So whether it be a, a very strong-held view about, uh, you know, the political situation. I mean, Midnight Oil write a lot about political situations. Uh, my, and I've written uh, some things about that, but in, I think it's just processing my own um, inner feelings about my emotions, about, say, say romance and relationships. Um, reminiscing was written, I used to love, um, I lived, when I was younger, I used to live in the, the fantasy world of the black and white movies of the, 40s and 50s, Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers, all that sort of um, fantasy life, which was the life I wanted to have, which I didn't have, but was the life I wanted to have. So I was able to write my songs and immerse myself in what it would be like to have lived in that era. Uh, and so my song, well, so, so, so I wrote about how I was feeling and, and also how I would like my life to be and also what's wrong with the world, which is what people like Bob Dylan wrote about too. But um, So it's just my own thoughts and my opinion on things. You put it through your songs, opinion on yourself, how you're feeling. So it's really all, all autobiographical and, and you've got to be willing to put it out there and bear your soul. If, cause, and then it's likely, as happened with me, that someone else will be feeling the same way. And that's see, why do people react to a a song that's quite popular. It's because it's speaking to them. It's not just the beat or that sounds like a good idea. There's something that if you feel sad or if you feel happy, you know, you've got to have music to help you express that, whether you want to go out and dance or you want to cry with a wine or something. You need a music to help you, you see. So I figure that what I'm experiencing, there are other people in the world that feel that way. They're either uh, never found the person that they wanted or couldn't be with the one they wanted, so unrequited love, or they're living in a world that they don't like anymore or they just don't fit into society the way they want. Well, when you write those sort of songs, then another person w will want to play that because you're saying th what they feel. And that's the... But that's the whole job of art is to express the inner life, you see, it's the, I've always felt that the inner life of a person 
is far more interesting and important than the external life. Because usually all we do is now you come here and you say, well, you did this and what was your career like? But we don't ever talk about the inner journey of, you know, uh, living a life young, what happened to you when you were a kid. And, and, but it's the process of that inner life for, for somehow when you're a teenager and then suddenly when you get to my age, when you're old and you've had a, an external life that's delivered well for you, but I'm such a different person now than I was when I was 13. So there's been an inner growth that's happened along the way, you see. So the songwriting and art is expressing that hidden journey. That's, that's what I feel. What would you say to the inner 13-year-old Graham, if you could? Uh, no, nothing in particular, because um, I, I didn't... I didn't... Um, I was confident in that I was safe in the world at that point. And you know, I, I didn't feel that I just needed to do what I, what I would do. And, and it panned out, like when, when we first went to America, I, I didn't feel like this is just absolutely incredible. I thought, well, this is like the next step. It was sort of like, it was part of the plan. And I never thought, well, I'm going to do this, this and this, and then we finally make it and we do that and that. It was just sort of okay. I was in Adelaide, then I then eventually the opportunity came to live in Melbourne, and then I met B. Bertles, and then we went to we toured around for a few years, and we went to England. I met Glenn Shorrock, but I didn't think, oh wow, now what are we going to do? It was always well, okay. Um, it all seemed to like the phone rings, and you you get your next thing. It's not about working out what the end game is. It's about working out your next thing. The only difference probably was that I guess. A lot of musicians don't think f too far past next Saturday night's gig, whereas I always had that long view. I always felt that if I'm gigging, like it was, eventually it's going to be an international thing. I had a sense of that. And so when it actually arrived and we were touring and doing stadiums and all that sort of stuff, I never got um, just blown away because I thought, well, it's just sort of like, you know, you grow up, you get married, you have kids and you get a mortgage and it's part of life. So as a musician, I just felt I'll eventually have an opportunity to experience what my abilities can take me to. So, and I was fortunate that um, it worked out, but I didn't think, what if it doesn't work out? I never thought that at all. And it did work out. So I can't answer for other people, but I can just say from my own, from my own experience that I never thought about what if. I never had a plan B, just the plan A, that was it. And how proud are you to be recognised this January 26th for all that you've done? Well, I don't know that pride's the right thing. I think my kids are very proud and they, they, they experience that more. And I'm just grateful that any artist gets recognition at this level along with other wonderful people in Australia because to have any of our artists recognised in, on a national day like Australia Day is a wonderful thing. And the fact that I'm one of them is um, it's an amazing thing. It, it, it will ha assist in possibly um, talking to government about more about the arts and why aren't you helping us more or funding this and funding that. If you can put that little OIM on the end, it maybe helps a little bit. I don't know, but... Um, I just think it's great for the arts that 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 I've received this award uh, on today. So, yeah. Beautiful. I think that's everything, Negro. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Was excellent. I could talk for hours about music. Could you? Yeah, I really could.